Each episode of Brain Health Unchaining Your Pain with Dr. Ruth Allen is for educational and demonstration purposes only. The information shared in each episode should not be interpreted as medical advice. This episode should not be used to self-diagnose or self-treat any health, medical or physical condition. Do not use this episode to avoid going to your healthcare professional or to replace the advice they give you. Consult with a trusted healthcare professional before doing anything contained in this episode. If you have any questions or concerns, please contact www.ruthmaryallen.com forward slash connect. Welcome to the show, Brain Health Unchaining Your Pain. I am really looking forward to this episode because I have been joined again by the wonderful Dr. Leo Gallen. Welcome to the show, Dr. Leo. So nice to be with you again, Ruth. Oh, it's so lovely. And for those that don't know Dr. Leo Gallen, he spent the last 40 years treating patients with complex chronic illnesses. He's developed innovative approaches to evaluation and treatment that has helped to create the foundation for functional medicine. And his latest focus has been on the reversal of long COVID. And I know that we connected because I had COVID back in 2000, I think it was now. uh, And I stumbled across your website and you just gave everything that I needed to know (laughs) and all the steps I needed to take. And you kindly gave me some guidance as well. So I'm so thankful uh, because by taking the action that you recommended, I have thankfully, fingers crossed, um, not developed long COVID and I've had it twice now. So um, really appreciative of, of the information that you provide um, to help others. So thank you once again for coming on the show to share your wisdom. Well, my goal for the, over the past couple of years has, to been, has been to, number one, to try and help people understand how they can prevent the late complications of COVID-19 by understanding the changes that occur in the body when you get COVID. And um, I've been able to measure these changes in some people who think they fully recover. I like to track them on, and make sure that there's a return to normal mm-hmm. afterwards. Mm-hmm. And I think it's so important, isn't it? Because there's been so much misinformation and there's been a huge educational curve just in the medical community uh, of our understanding of what COVID is um, and what the long-term consequences can be if we aren't cognizant of how it interacts with our body uh, and what knock-on effect, effect it can have not only to the way in which it enters our system through the respiratory tract but also the way in which it can impact every single organ of our body depending on what our risk factors are um, to uh, the, the virus attacking us from an entry perspective. Um, right, you're, you're... You're absolutely right. And the thing about about this virus is it enters, as you said, as a respiratory infection, but it really um, impacts the blood vessels and blood flow. And through that, it then impacts the health of all of the organs. uh, And it creates changes in those blood vessels and consequently in the clotting system in the body Mm -hmm. so that there are disturbances even in healthy young people who appear to have fully recovered, abnormalities of blood flow can be detected for months and months Mm -hmm. after they recover from Mm COVID-19. And there are really a few types of patterns that have been described in terms of the late consequences of having COVID. Um, The concept of long COVID is that you never really get well. Mm -hmm. That is, you get the illness, but there are these lingering symptoms that last for varying periods of time. And some people, they don't, they don't spontaneously go away. Mm-hmm. Two years later, they're still there. And, and this has been described in even in children. A recent um, large review and meta-analysis found that at three months, 16% of children still had at least one symptom associated wow. with COVID, which is, you know, I mean, that's obviously quite disturbing. Mm-hmm. Um, the sec- there's another pattern in which the person seems to get better, but then something happens and symptoms are created. It may be the symptoms that you originally had when you had COVID, mm-hmm. or it may be some additional or different symptoms. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a second pattern. And um, But aside from the obvious illnesses that are called long COVID or the symptoms that are called long COVID, there are changes, there, there are other things that happen after COVID-19. There is um, an increased risk of heart attacks, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, kidney problems, gastrointestinal problems, and neurologic problems mm-hmm. that may occur, that have been, that's been documented over mm-hmm. the, um, let's say, 15 months after the onset of COVID. And um, just, just a time back behind that, if you wouldn't mind, sorry for interrupting, is when the risk increases, and I know we may not have enough data yet, but do we know over what time period that risk is present? Does it diminish or does it stay omnipresent that, for the rest well, of your life? Yeah, that hasn't really been well established. Okay. Um, the, the Because they'll, they'll look, so far researchers have only been able to look at blocks of time, mm-hmm. you know, 12 months, 15 months. Yeah. So I, I haven't seen the that the graphed. Risk. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and... Um, uh, and then there, the other issue is there's some people that have underlying disorders. Mm-hmm. Maybe they weren't even paying attention to them. And those get worse afterwards. Autoimmune disorders, for example. People who are seen predisposed to autoimmunity um, based upon a variety of factors have um, a doubling of their risk of developing some kind of new autoimmune disease afterwards. Okay. So uh, it's it's my belief that all of these problems derive from the same alteration in the physiology of the body produced by COVID-19. And I created a diagram about a year and a half ago, a graphic called the web of long COVID to try and explain that. I I first created it to help me understand all of the research that I was uncovering, but then I realized that this is a tool that I can use to communicate with people. And that I feature on my website. and, and, and that's explain. in your latest document as well. Yes, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I think I would say it, stu- it stood the test of time because every time I see a new research study, um, and and I I mean I spent probably four thousand hours in, in studying the research over since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, in addition to treating patients, and every time I see a new research study, it has a place in the web. Yeah. And, and more importantly, if I can identify where it is in the web, it helps me understand it better. It's not just a massive information. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I think the, I, I think one of the biggest problems with COVID and with long COVID is the lack of clear communication and understanding about this disease and what we know about it. And so there's this aura of, um, like here's a mysterious monster that's mm-hmm. coming and that's very damaging to the people's psyche mm-hmm. uh, i've gotten so much feedback about you know from the what i've put together which basically starts with thank you for explaining this yeah and thank now, you <laughs> yeah now i understand it i understand my symptoms i understand what's going on um and um i you know i, I mean i think that's that's the first step. And that was my first goal is to try and help people um, realize that, yeah, this is complicated, but it's not some terrible mystery disease. It yeah. may be terrible and it may be very hard to treat in some people, yeah. but there are actions that can be taken and there are things yeah. that you can do yourself that uh, and the self-care definitely works best the earlier you implement, you know, in in, and one of the things that really encouraged me to pursue this is in my own practice among patients that I started treating for COVID at the yeah. onset of their illness, um, hardly anybody went on to get long COVID. Um, Which is were, amazing. Yeah, it's, well, it, it said, what that said to me is, okay, I think I've re- I, I think I really understand the factors that are driving it. So if we can deal with them at the time of infection, mm-hmm. then we can move things through to a full resolution. Yeah, so it's kind of pre- prevention, but the at the very outset of the infection occurring, um, which I think is so important, you know, and, and because it's such an integrated uh, functional medicine approach that you take, which is which is absolutely fundamental to addressing 
um, COVID because it starts at a cellular level. It's a cellular assault um, mm -hmm. that, that you need to you need to look at the whole system um, and where that assault has occurred and how far the web stretches, right. as you, you know, as you describe. So I wondered if we could go back to the basics of where the assault starts in our body for those that may be not familiar with it and take it right back to basics sure. so people can understand what happens when when you um, have an a attack, uh, you're under attack well, from, um, from well, the virus. Right. Well, um, the virus has to get into your cells to make you sick. Mm -hmm. And so it needs to find some protein usually on the cell surface that acts as a receptor or a gateway. Mm -hmm. And um, in the case of COVID-19, the main gateway, it's not the only one, but it is the main one, mm -hmm. is an enzyme called ACE2. And this was also the gateway for the SARS virus 20 mm -hmm. years ago. And uh, those are the only two viruses that target ACE2. The thing about ACE2, my, my, when I read this in March of 2020, when, you know, when researchers said, oh, it's the same gateway, you know, my first thought was, oh, well, let's find a way to block that. And that's yeah. going to help people not get sick. Well, the problem is ACE2 is, is a critically important enzyme for yeah. your body. And it, it functions as, to reverse the effects of inflammation and infection. Uh, mm -hmm. That is, when you get infected with something, your body mounts an, a, you know, a strong defensive an, an attack, basically. The best defense is a good offense. So good you, counter -attack. You, you go into, you know, you go into, into war mode and attack mode. Um, that can cause a lot of damage to, to your own cells. And so ACE2 is there to counteract that, bring it back, bring things back to baseline. If you lose ACE2, and that's what the virus does, that when it enters cells, it damages ACE2, it destroys mm -hmm. it, it destroys its activity through multiple mechanisms. Uh, so when that happens, you now have difficulty controlling the inflammation, the blood clotting, the scarring that occurs. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, the first part of what I think is important is restoring ACE2 activity mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in the, uh, as the infection is being fought and mm -hmm. in, in its aftermath. And, and that can be achieved through aspects of diet and lifestyle. Um, and there are a number of nutritional supplements. Uh, vitamin D is one, mm -hmm. for example. And there's a lot of data indicating that the level of vitamin D in your body has a major impact on the outcome of acute COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen anybody look at it in terms of long COVID. Mm -hmm. um, there are um, natural products that I recommend. Curcumin, mm -hmm. uh, which was shown to decrease the severity of acute COVID and actually to decrease the inflammatory response to uh, the COVID vaccine. Uh, that can be very helpful. And that also raises ACE2 levels in mm -hmm. the body. Um, resveratrol. Uh, yeah, I took both product. of those when you... Um you know, with your mm. advice. And that was really super helpful. Yeah, I think, I think the, um, those things plus diet, I mean, mm -hmm. there's um, uh, a high fiber polyphenol rich mm -hmm. diet has an impact. Um, the so so that's a that's really at the center. Now, the second aspect of this is mitochondrial damage. Mm. And mitochondria um, are responsible for most of the energy that's produced in your body. They have a major impact on cell function. Mm -hmm. They also have an important impact in the immune system. Um, and when your immune system goes into an attack mode, it mostly moves away from mitochondrial um, activity towards something called aerobic glycolysis, which is the way that cancer cells derive their energy also. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is very efficient for certain purposes, but it's a real high risk uh, for us. And so restoring mitochondrial function is part of bringing the immune system back into a state of balance. Um, and this virus has many ways to impair mitochondrial function. Yeah. Uh, all, all infections, uh, mitochondria take a hit with any kind of infection. Yeah. Which is why we get so energy depleted, because it's like our battery is the equivalent of a battery in, in, in your torch. Right. And, it, and it produces um, redox signaling molecules or electrons, if you will, as the analogy. And then the ATP, which is your energy. And when you hit the battery and deplete it, that's why. Right. We get and, so you know, and when your ATP levels drop, certain other systems kick in that may be helpful in fighting the infection. Um, but when it comes to recovering 
you really want your immune system in particular and, and probably to be able to move over into into mitochondrial energy uh, mitochondria is its source of energy mm -hmm. and um and so mitochondrial support can be very important especially if there's um fatigue if there's ongoing fatigue and trouble recovering mm -hmm. uh, and i think that's one of the reasons why this is not a virus that you should try to exercise through <laughs> <laughs> you know you should you really need to give yourself a break when yeah. you have it. Um, you know, like don't go sweat it out and, you know, go for a run or go to the gym. Yeah, don't run um, your battery flat when it's already right. flat. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, there are a number of things that support mitochondrial function. The um, the one, the specific, and there are no, virtually no drugs that'll do that. The yeah. specific um, substance, the natural product that has the best data for it is coenzyme Q10, uh -huh. which is... Um, and supplementation with coenzyme Q10 and sometimes certain vitamins mm -hmm. can really impact mitochondrial function. And the vitamin B3, niacin, is mm -hmm. tops on the list, but B1 and B2 also um, have an effect. And there have been some studies with uh, MECFS that have shown the impact mm -hmm of especially CoQ10 and special forms of niacin. So, so just to summarize for those that are listening, because I know you've mentioned a lot, is you've got two things that you have to focus on. The first thing is you need to restore your ACE2 because they get depleted because they get attacked as the virus enters your cell. Uh, and Dr. Leo Gallen's mentioned many ways in which to do that. Vitamin D, an appropriate diet, um, uh, fiber, curcumin, resveratrol, um, I don't know if I've met omega-3, vitamin C. I don't think you mentioned those, but they're all, they all support um, uh, your uh, ACE2, building your ACE2, but particularly curcumin and, and resveratrol are really helpful with vitamin D, optimised. And then the second one is making you re restore your battery powerhouse in your cell, which is your mitochondria that get depleted because they get attacked too. Um, and it's important that you use the uh, appropriate inter interventions to restore that and coenzyme q10 is one of the main players uh, for that which you can get as a, a as an, a supplement right now in the web of long covid radiating out from <laughs> those uh from the center that's the center of the web there are strands yeah that um sit each of them i named after some kind of um physiologic disturbance the names, I mean, there wasn't, there's limited an, an amount of room for writing on that web. So I had to simplify things, but probably um, two of the most important. Um, one is damage to the lining of blood vessels, uh, yeah. which is called endotheliitis or endotheliolitis. And, and that, uh, that occurs, that's virtually universal with COVID. Mm -hmm. it, it even may be produced by the vaccines yeah, um, because it doesn't require live virus, that spike protein binds to the lining of blood vessels. It attaches to ACE2 mm -hmm. it, um, and it can create inflammation mm -hmm. on its own. And there's and, quite a strong movement here in the UK, actually, by Dr. Asim Mahotra, who is a, a very strong advocate to, to not being vaccinated. And I don't want to go into the detail here, but there's lots of information uh, for for him that you know as to the risk factor that you just mentioned on okay. some types of virus. Um, well, look, I I would say that when it comes to COVID in um, a large part of the population, mm -hmm. the um, the data indicates that the vaccines actually have had beneficial effects on serious illness and mortality, mm -hmm. and and I think I understand the reason because. But that, that's a whole separate discussion. Yeah, yeah. The the antibodies produced by vaccination are different than the antibodies produced by natural infection. Mm -hmm. And for a high-risk person who gets an acute infection, that's actually safer. It's beneficial. Okay, yeah. The um uh the but um the the impairment in blood flow occurs all over the body, including the brain. Yeah. I mean you can mm -hmm. measure it in the in the retina of the eyes and the tissues under the tongue in the skin those are the easiest to measure but it does occur in the brain and it persists mm -hmm. for um, eight months maybe wow. longer mm -hmm. afterwards and that may be associated with the brain fog mm -hmm. um, it occurs in the lungs and there it may be associated with shortness of breath i mean mm -hmm. there's so many people that have consulted me and they've said 
And I, I just don't have the same breathing capacity since that I had before COVID. Well, I've had my heart checked out. There's nothing wrong with my heart. I've had my lungs checked out. They're perfectly fine. Yeah, the, the issue there is there actually has been a deep a loss of, of the smallest blood vessels, tiny capillaries in the lungs as a result of this infection, and they need to be rebuilt. And, okay. and in fact, there was there's a study that came out recently that found um, two markers in the blood that could predict long COVID with 96% accuracy compared to healthy people. Um, they didn't look at people who had fully recovered, but okay. this was... This could tell you who has post-COVID symptoms. Mm -hmm. and, and they're both markers that indicate the body is trying to build more blood vessels. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that seems to be a, a, a near universal component of long COVID. Now, ACE2 plays an important role in the creation of new blood vessels and in the health of blood vessels. So that's the, that's the first thing that I turn to, but um, there may be other measures that can help blood vessels heal. Um, and that's, you know, that that's an area that's being explored. There are possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, there's a drug that not available in the UK or the US readily that was shown to do it um, called sulodexide. It's, um, it's a quasi-natural product, actually. Um, Pycnogenol, which is derived from the bark of the French maritime pine, and that's available as a supplement globally. That was shown to help with the damage. Wow. Um, and, right. Yeah. So, um, and, and then um, there's an amino acid called arginine mm -hmm. that um, was shown in people who have fatigue post-COVID months, like six months later. Arginine supplementation um, helped their fatigue. And what arginine does is it was a combination of arginine and vitamin C, but the arginine was the real driver of it. Mm -hmm. um, you needed, a, it was about 3,200 milligrams a day. Mm -hmm. And what arginine was shown to do was to improve blood flow. So um, arginine's a little tricky though. I mean, every, every aspect of this is tricky because if you <laughs> happen to have a reactivation of a herpes virus infection okay. after COVID, arginine is food for herpes viruses. Okay. So you definitely okay. don't want to be taking Yeah, that. you don't want to just, there, there's not a one size fits all. You have yeah. to, uh, you, and, and that's the way the document that I have on my website, um, Long COVID Prevention and Treatment, yeah. it's about 50 pages. It was designed to try and help people figure out this is relevant to me. Mm -hmm. um, the Now the, the blood vessel damage then creates um uh, a tendency to form blood clots. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I didn't mention omega-3s earlier because omega-3s are very helpful. Mm -hmm. Aspirin can be helpful mm -hmm. um, in um, preventing or reversing blood clots. Sometimes you mm -hmm. need to go with, with medication that you can't just use yourself. Um, a third component that I think is, um, and I, uh, I'm not going to try to go through the entire no, no, that's yeah. okay. <laughs> but the third component that is very important for people is something called mast cell activation. Yeah. And mast cells are these uh, primitive cells in your immune system. They don't really circulate in blood. They're in your tissues. And they're not very many of them, but they're very powerful. Mm -hmm. And they release about 200 different chemicals when they're activated, including histamine, which is probably the best known uh, mast cell chemical. And those uh, do several things. Number one, histamine actually increases the ability of the virus to enter your cells. Okay. Um, it also um, has, um, uh, it also can aggravate the, endo, the, the endothelial, the blood vessel inflammation. It mm -hmm. can aggravate blood clotting. Um, and a lot of people find that the use of antihistamines is helpful. Um, during long COVID. And there actually was a controlled clinical study which used um, an, a type of antihistamine that's not used for allergies. It's used for uh, heartburn and ulcers, famotidine. Mm -hmm. And it found that um, this was a placebo-controlled randomized trial. 
in people who had experienced cognitive dysfunction and emotional distress post-COVID, famotidine at a dose of 40 milligrams twice a day produced a significant improvement compared to placebo. So um, that's something else that many people have tried and, and find helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and once you, uh, what I found is among the patients that I've been treating who are not responding well, Mm -hmm. to the basic things like the mitochondrial mm -hmm. enhancement, the ACE2 enhancement, um, attempts to improve blood flow or deal with clotting, um, mm -hmm. especially for people who actually have adverse reactions to the things that help everybody else, that um, almost all of those people have mast cell activation occurring. And that's the 800-pound gorilla in the room. You have to deal with calming the mast cells in order yeah. to be able to move on. Um, and Mast cell activation is strongly associated with some of the neurologic complications that occur, sort of at the level of damage to organs. Um, the most common and troubling of which is POTS. Yeah, okay. Which positional orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, in which your heart races mm -hmm. uh, when you stand up. So if you're lying, so you, you, you might feel better, pretty good if you're lying or resting. Um, you get up, you can't stand for a few minutes. Um, uh, you really need to rest. Um, that phenomenon of orthostatic intolerance is one of the major neurologic complications and strongly associated with mast cell problems, uh, but sometimes has to be dealt with on its own, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, and uh, with a lot of fluid mm -hmm. and salt to expand your blood volume, um, sometimes with special support hose. Mm -hmm. um, there are drugs that can work. There are some natural products that I've mentioned that have been shown to help slow the heart rate, mm -hmm. vitamin B1, thiamine. Mm -hmm. Some people do better with a gluten-free diet who have the um, postural tachycardia. Mm -hmm. um, and the exact reason for that hasn't been worked out, uh, it's, but it is a controlled observation. Uh, vitamin D is important for those people. Melatonin. They also have a beneficial effect. In Which is difficult to get hold of here in the UK. Oh, it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know, it's not, it's not like a, a wonder treatment, like, oh, mm -hmm. you know, let's, um, it's, there are, there are a lot of things that can help individual patients and sometimes it's small increments. Mm -hmm. um, and the pattern of exercise, mm -hmm. if you have, um, if you have orthostatic intolerance, one of the biggest problems is you're not going to be, you're going to curtail your activity because you feel so much better when yeah. you're not upright. So you can start doing uh, supine exercises with uh, stretch bands and things like yeah. that. And I have some links to sources you can go to for that. Um, uh, and, and I also have uh, um, a link to a video that I put out on mast cell activation mm -hmm. uh, and a whole section kind of uh, describing therapeutic approaches. Um, another aspect that I think is very important and that it does not really receive enough attention is the relationship with the gut and oh, yeah, gut microbiome and, and the phenomenon of leaky gut. Yeah. ACE2 is expressed on the cells that line the small and large intestine and um, the virus infects those cells and one of the, and, and it damages ACE2. Now, one of the effects of that is that ACE2 in the gut has um, a role that it doesn't have any place else in the body where, in, where it is involved in the transport and absorption of amino acids, especially tryptophan. Now, mm -hmm. tryptophan is just an essential amino acid with many critical roles in the body. We know it best because it's the precursor of serotonin and so it affects mood, but um, tryptophan also undergoes other metabolic changes in the body that impact the immune system. So the malabsorption of tryptophan that may occur with COVID-19 can impair immunity in the gut. Okay. And that then leads to um, changes in the microbiome, the, this collection of 100 trillion organisms that lives in your GI tract. And there was a lot of speculation. And let's just say that just as blood vessel changes are virtually universal with COVID-19, alterations in the gut microbiome, virtually universal. And yeah. at first, some of, some of my colleagues 
said, well, that's the reason people are getting sick because they've got microbiome is all screwed up. Well, that may be true for some people, but I've seen people who were really healthy before COVID and they had great lifestyles mm -hmm. um, and were just shattered by long COVID. Mm -hmm. And what the study seemed to indicate is that COVID-19 itself can alter and destroy the structure of your gut microbiome. Oh, wow. And, That's incredible. And, can then, and, and um, there's certain critical organisms that are lost. Um, the one that's been the most constantly shown to be lost is called Fecalobacterium prasmitzi. You can't get it. It's not available as a probiotic supplement. Mm -hmm. But it is what's, it's what's called a keystone species. Mm -hmm. It supports the growth of bifidobacteria, for example. Mm -hmm. And bifidobacteria get lost as well. And it is a major producer of a short-chain fatty acid called butyrate. Now, butyrate okay. is not only important for gut health, but it's absorbed. It has anti-inflammatory effects throughout mm -hmm. the body. It gets to the brain. And it mm -hmm. helps the brain restore itself after injury. Mm -hmm. So paying attention to restoring a healthy gut microbiome is very important. And studies have shown that the loss, what happens... With, with people get COVID-19, butyrate goes down, fecalobacterium presidency goes down. In people who recover, they come back. In people who develop long COVID, they don't. And that's a kind of critical turning point there, mm. um, uh, I think. I mean, based on the limited amount of data that's available for who's going to recover and who isn't going to recover. Yeah. Um, and and then there are some other organisms that actually can overgrow. And in a study that looked at um, how does the microbiome at the time of acute illness predict who's going to get long COVID, loss of butyrate and loss of fecal bacterium presidency was one. But there was also the overgrowth of another species mm -hmm. called Ruminococcus novus. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, again, impossible names to remember. But... Um, that group of organisms, the ruminococci, they can they produce some toxic metabolites mm -hmm. that are bad for your brain. And in an, in a mouse model, those metabolites were shown to accelerate age related cognitive decline. You know, one of the things that's that you'll read about is is um, you know having COVID, um, your brain ages ten years. Mm -hmm. Well, that could be. A result of the isoamylamine that's released by the uh, by the ruminococci. Mm -hmm. So, one of the things that I really try to pay attention to is trying to reverse the gut dysbiosis. And 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 as a result of gut dysbiosis, you get leaky gut, which um, then causes more infections. Yeah, more which then causes issues. more inflammation, and and bacteria can actually get into the blood. Um, probably one of the most feared complications. COVID in children is this thing called MIS-C, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Mm -hmm. And um, that is associated with evidence of leaky gut and treating the leaky gut helps all the other treatments for it get better. And I think the key, you know, the key protagonist parking COVID for leaky gut is often gluten. For um, a lot of people it is. Yeah. Um, and I and, and our Stru you know, the structure of gluten, there's been in loads of episodes we talked about this, but the structure of gluten has changed in the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. And so we've become more uh, sensitive to gluten than we ever were because there's more gluten in our diet than we ever used to have. And it's a slightly different structure. And so it's really important if you are if you have a child um, uh, that you minimize their gluten consumption, if possible, to strengthen their gut lining. Right. Right. And and. In, in addition to that, there is the loss of bifidobacteria because mm -hmm. bifidobacteria actually break down gluten. Mm -hmm. They actually secrete enzymes that help to break down the peptides, and, to break down the protein and the peptides in gluten and make yeah. them less damaging. So I, I would say as a culture, we start out probably with a bifidobacterial deficit. You then get COVID-19 that aggravates it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, and. and there are, and there are also effects of, there are other environmental effects, but I, I agree with that one. Um, yeah. And, you know, air pollution, uh, yeah. exposure to the phthalates and plastics. Yeah. Uh, those alter the way the immune system works. 
and may negatively impact the effect of long COVID. Well, we all have microplastics in our bodies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm not sure exactly what we can do about that at this point, except to find ways to compensate Mm -hmm. for the exposures that we have yeah and to to um, i don't know if we are we actually able to detox microplastics from our system i, I haven't i haven't seen anything that yeah, um, anything. yeah that tells me about that um yeah. i'm looking into ways to overcome the effects of phthalates on yeah. immunity and, and i i think there are there is a route to doing that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you know for people that are listening who have um the symptoms of long COVID, um, what would your recommendation be uh, for those that maybe, let's start with the different types of issues that people may have. And I know it's difficult because everybody's unique, um, but people who, who have uh, lung uh, problems where they where they uh, are struggling to breathe or, the, or, or they're lacking right. in the ability to, to to do to do right. the, the and that we do. I, I try to deal with that aspect also in the in the document. Mm-hmm. Um, the um, almost always the shortness of breath. If sometimes it's due to asthma or a flare mm-hmm. up of an asthmatic problem. And that's actually ACE two deficiency anyway, isn't it? Yeah, ACE two has an impact on yeah. asthma. Um, and the but um but most of the time i think for those people who are really troubled and who are told you know if your doctor can't find anything wrong with your heart or lungs um it's loss of blood blood vessels in the lungs okay. and that's where and there are some things that may be helpful there mm-hmm. um including um pycnogenol as i mentioned mm-hmm. um another natural product called vinpacetin which mm-hmm. is derived from periwinkle that was shown to improve blood flow in the lungs, um, sometimes aspirin is helpful, mm-hmm. omega threes because you have to also counteract the blood clotting. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some um, uh, there are sulodexide, mm-hmm. this product that's available mostly in non English speaking countries, mm-hmm. um, but I have located a pharmacy in Lebanon that mm-hmm. will ship it um, internationally. Okay, um, and it's very safe. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, has been shown to relieve. Um, the the chest discomfort in a controlled okay. study that people get after COVID that mm-hmm. that it can be so hard mm-hmm. to reverse. Um, so that for people whose main concern is with shortness of breath, mm-hmm. I would really focus on blood flow and blood clotting okay. as the route to overcoming that. And those with um, cognitively, because it's all about brain health. Okay. All right. Well, um, the first, yeah. The, so the cognitive problems also involve blood flow. Of course, but. But um, uh, there I specifically start, um, I look at two things. Um, the, first of all, things like curcumin and resveratrol yeah. have been shown to help the brain. Butyrate has been shown to help the mm-hmm. brain. So the ACE2 recovery, the gut microbiome are helpful. Omega-3 fats. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we're mostly alpha- deficient on those, many yes. people. <laughs> right, right. Those have been shown to help brain recovery as well as the outcome of acute COVID, and then alpha-lipoic acid, which is an antioxidant. It's good for the nervous system. Um, There are hundreds of clinical trials with Mm -hmm. it, and that actually helps the omega-3s work better in the Mm -hmm. brain. Um, So sometimes um, if you can deal with the mast cell activation, the cognitive function can improve as I cited that study with famotidine. Okay. Okay. Absolutely fascinating. And I know you mentioned all about the gut dysbiosis. So just key things that people can do there if they're struggling with their gut okay. function. Right. Well, a lot depends on um, what, what your GI symptoms are like. Yeah. Of but course. In general, a high fiber diet, high in fruits, vegetables, seeds, spices, um, and herbs, a high polyphenol, high fiber diet is sort of is the first approach. Uh, sometimes quercetin, a bioflavonoid, mm-hmm. is helpful uh, for the gut. Probiotics can make a difference. Mm-hmm. And um, there, there actually was a study using a Mexican probiotic that found that it hastened recovery from acute COVID nineteen. Um, a colleague of mine has found it helpful with um, with long COVID and the. There are four species in there. Three of them belong to, or or four strains, three of them belong to a species called Lactobacillus plantarum. Now, Lactobacillus plantarum 
as implied by its name, is found in plants. So sauerkraut, kimchi, mm -hmm. um, fermented foods, uh, especially vegetable foods, are sources of lactobacillus plantarum. And they actually help the immune system recover. Mm -hmm. um, so, and this is all applicable for kids as well, because yeah, kids absolutely do leave everything <laughs> that I've said can be done with kids. Yeah. And that, so, but here's where the so a diet high in fermented foods may make a difference. Well, mm -hmm. if you happen to have a major mast cell problem or histamine intolerance, you might not tolerate those. Mm -hmm. So that's why each person has to work out the path that is going to help them the most by looking at your spider's web. Your web, yes. your web of COVID. Yeah, and I've tried to put in the cautions, like, oh, watch out for this, because yeah. just because this is going to work for someone else doesn't, you know, if you start noticing that you're having this problem, you better back off and mm -hmm. go in a different direction. Yeah, I think the key is also to get your fundamentals right. So, you know, to focus on your diet and optimizing your diet, like you mentioned, with, with clean food, vegetables, fruit, fiber, nuts, seeds. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, right. And sleep, <laughs> sleep, the right balance of rest and exercise, yeah, um, and a healthy diet, yeah. Those are really yeah. the fundamentals. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, there was a there was a study that was done. It didn't look at long COVID, but it looked at acute COVID, and um, it was done through Columbia and Johns Hopkins University mm -hmm. in the states um, and a couple of other major medical centers. It was an international study. They looked at healthcare workers mostly male physicians, and they looked at the outcome of acute COVID in those uh, people. Um, these were all people who had survived, but they looked at, did they have a mild in, or asymptomatic infection or a moderate or severe infection? And they looked at their diet in the year prior to getting COVID. And a diet that was basically a pesca vegetarian diet was associated with the best outcome. I think it was seventy um, percent, wasn't it? Yeah, it, yeah, a major like improvement. It. Whereas low carb diets were associated with a worse outcome. Yeah. Now, when you looked at the difference, um, it the, it's not as if the the vegetarian diets were truly vegetarian. They weren't, but yeah. they had they had twice as many vegetables in them as the yeah. low carb diets. Yeah. And yeah, a 40% in increase in vegetable consumption was associated with a 70% decrease in the risk of severe COVID. Yeah. Now, I mean, if there was a drug that did that, it would be all over the newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. And isn't it amazing that we just need to go to our pharmacy with an F, F A N R M, yes. right. uh, is often can be, you know, more important in the first line of defense than than to go to your drugstore right right now i but i do want to add that i've seen people whose health was perfect and their lifestyles impeccable prior to covid yeah who got shattered by covid mm -hmm. and um so it's not your fault that you get long covid nonetheless there are things that you can do getting the basics right is the beginning of it yeah and it's incremental. You need, you know, everybody's unique, and we have to look at the person yes. from a unique, personalized mm -hmm. perspective uh, and work our way through that web to to get to the root cause of the problem. Um, yes, uh, yes, and um, hopefully over time there will be more health practitioners who know how to help people who get stuck. Um, yes, yeah. you know, there there are parts of this. If if you've developed certain neurologic problems, especially which I think are would really hang people up you might have a hard time overcoming it through mm -hmm. your own efforts, through the mm -hmm. things that you can do. Um, and one of the most challenging complications is this phenomenon inappropriately named called post-exercise malaise or PEM. I mean, malaise does not describe what happens mm -hmm. to people who are affected by this. It, you know, I mean, it's more like post-exercise monster crushes <laughs> you and it can take days or weeks for you to recover, yeah. um, which is why, I, and which is why I really recommend that people go very slowly and un listen to their bodies. Yeah, I've seen so many people who said, um, who consulted me and said, you know, I was doing pretty well, but then I overdid it, and overdoing it is uh, is a fraction of what they had been able to do pre-COVID, mm -hmm. and then I just crashed, mm -hmm. and um, and I haven't managed to come back since then. Mm -hmm. So I think a real awareness of how your body is doing, how much you can push yourself, 
is important. Mm -hmm. and, and especially because reconditioning is a really important part of the healing. Yeah. And to restore your function back to a level that is acceptable for you. You, you can't yes. just go fast and expect it to happen. Right. It's the same as losing weight, isn't it? We don't, you know, we don't expect to shed 30 pounds in a week. If we, uh, if we want to restore our, you know, the weight that we, right. we want to be at, we have to go slow because uh, then it, it happens over the longer term. It's the same kind of principle. So it's been absolutely fascinating. Dr. Leo Gallen, thank you so much for all of uh, your fantastic advice. As always, how can people learn more about you and um, how they can support themselves and recovering from long, long COVID? Okay, well, it, I created a document, Long COVID Prevention and Treatment, which is posted on my website, drgallen.com. Um, there's no strings attached, no charges. Um, there's just information there that is an attempt to help people understand how COVID has impacted their body and steps that you can take to begin trying to recover. Mm -hmm. um, and there's info, and there are a lot of references. There's information there you can take to your doctor. Yeah, it's super digestible it and shareable. <laughs> yeah. So it's brilliant. Thank you so much, Dr. Okay. Leo Gallen, for your wisdom and for your support. And that, go to www.drgallen.com to find out more. And I think there's a direct link there, isn't there, on your website? Yes. Mm -hmm. to, to that. Um, it's been fascinating. Remember, this show is all about brain health, unchaining your pain. You're not stuck with the brain you have. You have the power to make it better. And Dr. Leo Gallen has kindly been here to show us how in the context of COVID. Thank you, Dr. Leah Gallen. I really hope you enjoyed that conversation. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to like and share this episode and leave a review on my website or on Apple Podcasts. If you're looking for opportunities to optimise your brain health or unchain your pain from a past trauma, make sure you visit my website, www ruthmaryallen.com and use the code podcast10 at checkout to get 10% off all programs and always remember you are not stuck with the brain you have you have the power to make it better you have the power to unchain your pain and optimize your brain power and performance so that you can win back energy and time doing what you love